Well, happy Super Bowl Sunday, guys. How are you doing? Yeah? Who are we cheering for today? Chiefs? 49ers? Yeah? I love it that you guys are sitting on the opposite side of the room. That's, that's probably good, right? Um, so my wife showed up this morning in a cowboy shirt, and I don't have the heart to tell her that they're not going to do anything today, right? So uh, yeah, it's not, not, not good. But anyway, it's going to be a good day, and I'm glad that you're here at church. We're going to continue in our series, Becoming Us. And uh, in this series, we're looking at Paul's uh, letters to the church in Corinth. And we've talked about how Corinth is like this city that was a lot like America today. It was like a, like all of these cultures are coming together and all these, uh, there was sexual immorality, religious diversity and corruption that was happening and all this stuff was happening in the city. And Paul's trying to establish a church in this town and they're going through some things and, and they're influenced by the culture around them. They're following this guy and following that guy. And Paul's trying to say, Hey guys, this is really how we should be as the church. And as we're going through this series, we, and really we're, we're still very much a church plant. We're still young. We want to see how we should be as a church, how we should be as Christians. And, and we talked about a couple weeks ago that a healthy church is really just made up of healthy people unified in the pursuit of of following Jesus, right? And so for us, we have to go and that's the kind of the heart that we're looking at in, a, in approaching this. So we've covered like spiritual authority and purity in this series. And last week, the main point was that, that we have to love what God loves and hate what God hates. And we talked about how we have to confess our sin. We have to say the same thing about our sin as God does. And so if God calls it sin, we can't call it something else. We, if God calls it sin, we can't call it something, well, this is just what's appropriate in our culture. This is just what's appropriate in our day. This is just what people say is okay in our day. No, if God calls it that, we have to say the same thing. And the Bible promise us, promises us that when we confess our sin, that God is faithful to forgive us, to save us, to heal us, all throughout the New Testament that God is talking about. And I want to make one more point about last week's message on purity uh, before we get into this week's topic. And this is in uh, Paul. Paul talks about this in chapter 6 of, uh, of 1 Corinthians. He says this, flee from sexual immorality for every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but a sexual immoral person sins against his own body. Or do, I, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you whom you have from God? You are not your own. You are bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Paul also uses this analogy a lot of times uh, of the body when he's talking about the church, right? And so we have to make sure that we're not sinning against our own physical body, but that we're also not sinning against with division and pride and strife against the body of Christ, right? And so we have to make sure that we're doing that as believers. When I became a Christian, I am no longer my own. This is why confession is required. It's not my way of thinking. It's not, I'm not doing things the way that I think should be right. In Judges, it talks about the book of Judges. If you've ever read Judges, um, if, if the Bible were to get a rating, right? Like a movie gets a rating, like PG, PG-13, R. Just the book of Judges alone would be rated R. Crazy stuff was happening in that book. And if you read the book of Judges, what the book says was in that time, Man did right in his own eyes. Man did right in his own eyes. Man, each person said, you know, let me think about how, what's best for me. What's the best, what's the best way to live? What's the morality that I can shape on my own? And then you see the consequences of that, right? And so as we're becoming Christians, as we're becoming believers, as we're becoming a church, confession is required. We have to say the same things as God as we don't do things that are right in our own eyes. We do things according to how God teaches us. We can't make things up as we go along doing whatever feels right. Instead, I have to subject my worldview, my actions, my will to Christ because he purchased my freedom from sin. The good choices that you make are absolutely going to benefit you as a Christian, but we don't make them for our benefit. We make them to glorify God. Because now I'm free from sin, free from death, free from shame, and it's all because of Jesus. So our topic today is going to be found in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So if you got your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we're going to be in verse 17. How many of you guys have ever been in this situation? you got a car that you like, right? Sitting in the driveway, gets you where you need to be. 
At one point in time, you picked out the color. You, you like it. It's, it's doing what it needs to do. It's paid off. It runs. The, the AC blows. Sure, it may have a, a paint chip or a stain on the carpet here or there, you know, but, but you did that, right? And so you're just, you're just used to it. Like, this is my car. Like, this is what we do. It's like part of the family. How many of you guys have ever named a car? You named a car. Judas, what's the car name? Thomas, all right. Anybody else named a car? Yeah? Stella. So we have Thomas and Stella, right, are our car names, right? And so it's just part of the family. Like, it's just part of it. But then one day, you pull into your driveway. In your neighbor's driveway, there's a brand new, shiny, 2020 model of the car you've always wanted. Has that ever happened to you? Or something close to it? Yeah, you know, you, you see that or, or maybe you pull up in, in, in your, your, the parking lot at work and like your coworker all of a sudden is pulling up in this brand new nice car. You, you know, your, your sister got one, your brother, you know, it's just like, like it just happens like that. I, I've not always been a truck guy. I converted this summer to being a truck guy, right? I'm a truck guy now. Um, but for me, like this would be like a Ford Raptor, right? All right, the Ford F1, oh, they, they're just pretty, right? Liz wants a Camaro, Shh. I don't know if that's going to happen, but she wants a Camaro, right? That, like, the, so there's that car that you dream about. Like, but what would that be for you? And so now suddenly, Thomas looks a little bit different. Stella looks a little bit different. Stella, you know, she she was she was really pretty at one time, but now I don't know. I mean, there's that that car that I always wanted sitting right next door to me. And so we compare against other things. Thomas didn't change overnight. We're just comparing Thomas to the car next door. You guys ever been through this? Maybe it's not a car. Maybe it's just uh, uh, um, your sibling's career. How are they more successful than I am? You know, we grew up in the same house, went to the same schools. Uh, why, Why them and not me? Maybe it's your friend. Maybe you got a friend who's lost a ton of weight and looks better than they ever have. You may have ever had this happen to you, and they look amazing. Mike joked about how good I look. Man, I'm like the least attractive person that was up here today, right? Like Aaron, Mike, you guys got me killed, right? So like, like they're, they're just people that like, they, they, why can't I look like that? Maybe it's your coworker getting a ton of attention from the boss or getting a lot of praise and, you, and the, the boss barely acknowledges your existence. Comparison can really mess with your head. And comparison has three outcomes. One of them is actually good. And, and we're going to look at the three outcomes of comparison today. It is possible for comparison to be a good thing. It is possible for comparison to help us learn. In 1 Corinthians 11, later in the book, Paul talks about follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. There's no envy in that. Like, like hey, I'm, I'm doing the right thing. So if, if I'm following Christ, as Paul is Paul saying, as, as a spiritual leader, and I'm doing, I'm doing everything I can to follow Christ and be humble and be teachable and all that stuff, and there's parts of your life that don't look like that Corinthian church, just do what I do. Like, com- like compare your life to mine and, and, and help, let's, get, let's get this thing going. Let's be better in, in, as Christians. And so Paul says, follow my examples, I follow Christ. It's like when we're teaching our children how to wash the dishes. How many of you guys have ever sat your kid up on the counter and said, watch how I wash this plate, or watch how I wash this plate? Now you try it, right? Is that how we teach it, right? Do, compare how you would do it to the correct way that I'm teaching you to do it, right? And so that, that's a, a good way for comparison to work out. But when we talk about comparison, really for most of us, what we're thinking about is the kind of comparison that has just a little bit of envy in it. A little bit of envy in it, or a lot of envy in it. And it, and it just takes a little bit of that envy to make comparison toxic. Toxic comparison will either make you resent what other people have if you think that they're better off than you, or it will cause you to look down on people who aren't as far along as you. Toxic comparison will either make you look at people who, who maybe they have something, maybe they've got, the, they've got the new car, maybe they're getting attention from the boss, maybe they're, they're in a healthy relationship, maybe they're doing these things, and, and you're looking at them and you're like, why them, not me? Why don't I get that? And so there's that envy, there's that covetousness that's a, a part of that, and we, we struggle with that. Or maybe you look at someone else and you're like, man, they don't have their stuff together at all. How many of you guys ever know people like that? Like you're like, they just don't have it together. And so there's this toxic comparison that we do. And the thing that when we look at comparison, there are ditches on both sides of the road. 
Either, you're, either way, though, you're living in pride. Pride that I'm better off than them or pride that I should have what they have. And this is the issue that Paul addresses in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Chapter 7, verse 17. Let's read it. Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all churches. A life that the Lord has assigned us. In James 4, verse 16, he talks about this. He says, but he, that's God, gives more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And so for us, when we're, we're looking at our lives and we're looking at our friends and our neighbors and our coworkers and, and even people in our family and we're looking at them and we're comparing their life to us and either you're falling on the side of the ditch where you, you think you're better off than them or you're falling on the side of the ditch where you're, you're coveting the stuff that they have and you're doing these things, that's not a, a, a place of humility that that comes from. It's coming from a place of pride. And that pride is the toxic root of comparison. God gives you grace to lead the life that he has assigned to you. God has given you the grace that you need to lead the life that God has assigned to you. We live in a society, we live in a culture that's more anxious than ever, that's more depressed than ever, that's more overwhelmed than ever, that's more sad than ever, that's more unsettled than ever, that's more divisive than ever. Could it be because we're trying to live outside of the grace that God has given us? We're trying to live a life that other people have that is not the life that God has given us. And so for you and I, we have to get back to God. We have to put God first. We have to look at God and say, God, what are you giving me? What's the life that you've given me to lead? What is the life that you've given me to lead? Because I guarantee you, he's going to give you grace to lead that life. He's going to give you the grace that you need to lead that life. We have to stay in our lane. Does this mean that we should not have any dreams, that we should get rid of goals, that we shouldn't have vision for our lives, that we shouldn't uh, drive to better ourselves? Absolutely not. But what we have to do is we have to look at our drivers, look at what makes you want to get up in the morning, look at what makes you want to achieve things, look at what makes you want to accomplish things or get things or why do I want that car? Why do I want that job? Look at those drivers and you need to identify the origin of it. Is God leading you to it or is pride leading you to it? Is this something that God has put in my heart? God has put in my heart to, to, to plant a church. God has put in my heart to provide for my family. God has put in my heart to, to do these things. If, if God is leading you to it, then God is going to give you the grace for it. But if you're doing it because you are envious or you're covetous or, or, or you don't like that someone else has it and you do, if you're doing it for those reasons, God has not given you the grace to accomplish that. And so we always have to be careful and we always have to identify our drivers because sometimes even pride can hide itself in spirituality. Stuff that seems spiritual to us, like for, for, for some of us, it, you, you know, it seems spiritual, but pride can even hide itself in that. And so when we're looking at our drivers, when we're saying, God, what are you leading me to? What are you directing me? God, what, what are the steps? What are these things that, that you're wanting me to do? What are the conversations that I need to have? What are the things that I need to start? What are the things I need to quit? When you're looking at those drivers, you have to look and you have to be honest with yourself and say, God, is this from you or is it from me? Even in the case of things that are spiritual. Paul continues in uh, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 18. Again, he's talking about only leading the life that the Lord has assigned to you. In uh, verse 18, he says this, Was anyone at the time he was of his call, the time you were saved, the time that you became a Christian, was anyone at that time already circumcised? Now, in our culture, this is a medical procedure. However, to the Jew, this was a sign of a spiritual covenant with God that he made with Abraham. So this was a spiritual step. And so Paul says, were any of you the time that you were saved, were you already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. For either circumcision counts for anything 
or uncircumcision, but keep the commandments of God. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. The angriest that we see Paul in the Bible, the angriest that we see him when he's talking, he was talking in the book of Galatians, right? In the book of Galatians, the Galatian church was teaching that Jesus, that Jesus wasn't enough to be saved. You had to first become a Jew or be circumcised, then you could be saved. And so what we see with Paul is we see him addressing this issue. Like this is not from a spirit of pride. Don't compare yourselves to other people. Don't compare yourselves to their story. Don't compare yourselves to what they're going through. Whatever spiritual steps that they took to get to where they are, don't compare yourself to them in a spirit of pride because if you do that, then Jesus is not the only thing. Jesus is not enough. And Paul addresses this in Galatians. You can't live like this, guys. In Galatians 6, verse 11, he says this. See with what large letters I am writing you in my own hand. I mean, I'm, I'm, have you ever done that? Like, maybe you text in all caps. Like, we don't really write letters anymore, but like text in all caps, you know, make it bigger. Paul writes in really big letters in his own hand. And he says this. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may be perse- not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But far be it for me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not going to boast on what has happened. I'm not going to boast on this or that or whatever. It's all about Jesus, by which the, the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. Ben Myers, he's a theologian, he summed up Galatians this way. We felt insecure without our chains so we hired experts to repair them. Then Paul came back wielding a sledgehammer. <laughs> That's the book of Galatians in a nutshell. We had, there was these chains that we had, this, this thing of, of pride and this thing of, of ritual and this thing of comparison that we had. And we, for some reason, we felt insecure without them. So we hired experts to come repair them. But now Paul is coming back and saying, no, you are free in Jesus to lead the life that God has called you to lead. Pride is how spirituality is weaponized. Pride is how spirituality is weaponized. So we have to be careful in spiritual things, I would argue, especially in spiritual things, that we don't let pride get in the way. Paul continues in uh, 1 Corinthians 7. Were you a bondservant when you were called? Don't be concerned about it. But if you gain your freedom, avail yourself to the opportunity. For he who was called uh, in the Lord as a bondservant is a free man in the Lord. Likewise, he who is free when when called is a bondservant to Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants to men. Don't, Don't enslave yourself to the opinions of other people. Don't enslave yourself to the comparison of other people. So brothers, in which, in whatever condition each of us was called, let him him remain there. Do not let comparison make you a slave to other people. Instead, fix your eyes on God. Fix your eyes on God. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 and 2 says this, therefore, Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which easily uh, clings to us so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Run your race. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, this was his race, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Paul continue, or Paul says, only let each person live the life that the Lord has assigned to him, to which God has called him. I want to leave you today with a couple of thoughts about your calling, about the race that God has called you to. The race that God has called you to. Your calling. Running your race. The first uh, point is this. Your calling 
is present, not future. Your calling is present, not future. So many Christians live by this statement. If only I had blank, then I would blank. If only I had a million dollars, then I would give to the church. If only I had uh, 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 this, this time on my hands, then I would actually serve God more. If only I had this, then I would do that. But that idea, guys, is not biblical. Luke 16, 10 says this, one who is faithful in very little is also faithful with much, but one who is dishonest with very little is also dishonest with much. Your credibility as a believer, your credibility as a Christian comes from what you do with what God has placed in your hands today. And so you can't think, well, in the, in the future, in the long term, way, way down the road, you know, that's when I'm going to get everything together. No, it's today. I have to work out my own salvation today. I have to pursue my calling today. I have to be about what God is doing today. I need to, to, to do what I need to do. I need to get right with God today. I need to do all this stuff today because tomorrow, the Bible teaches us that tomorrow is not promised to us. And so if we live our lives in hope for circumstances to be different tomorrow and make allowances for our lives to live other ways that we know we shouldn't be living today, then guess what? We're missing out on what God has called us to do. Your calling is present, not future. Number two, your calling is active, not passive. The people that God uses don't always have the best of everything. Some of you are like, amen to that. The people that God uses don't always have the best of everything, but they make the most of everything. It's hard sometimes to see what God is doing in the natural. I mean, you guys have ever had like a really tough conversation with a loved one. You had a child that was rebelling. It's hard to see what God's doing in the natural sometimes. I mean, you guys have ever had had a um, situation at work where you know you're like, man, I don't know if I'm gonna, I don't know if I'm gonna get fired today. I don't know if we're the company's gonna stay open. I don't know what's happening here. It's hard to see what God is doing in the natural sometimes. But our calling is active, not passive. We we have to pursue. We have to be faithful. We have to do what we need to do every day, like we're talking about. We have to do this because our calling is active. About a year ago. Um, we we're getting ready to plant the church, and I was having a hard time just trying to uh, get things going in my head. And we were uh, we weren't where I wanted to be at the moment in in my head, and and you know just as a leader and just getting established and all this stuff, and it, just having a hard time with it. And um, I was sent this photo. You can go throw the photo up. So this right here in this photo, this is 1999 um, Amazon headquarters, and that is Jeff Bezos. That's the richest man in the world now in his office making Amazon when it was nothing. So many times we have in our idea or our mind like how things should be, how things should be, like how things, how things in our life should be. Man, I shouldn't have the debt that I have now. I shouldn't have the struggles with my kids that I have now. I shouldn't have the struggles in my, in my marriage that I have right now. I, I shouldn't have the, the struggles that I have with sin right now. I shouldn't have the struggles that I have. How many of you guys think like that? You felt like that. You felt like that, you know, is this real? And when I look at this picture, I'm like, man, like, like dude, that, that looks like struggle to me. That looks like a time where it's like, man, this is touch and go. I don't know if we're going to make it here. I don't know if this is going to happen. But the thing is, is that we have to be faithful to what God has called us to do. You can't take shortcuts in, the, the, in what God has called us to do. You have to stay active. You have to stay active. So your calling is uh, present, not future. Your calling is active, not passive. Number three, your calling is original. And this is what, what Paul was talking about when he, in, in, in verse 17. Lead the life that God has called you to. Lead the life that God has put in front of you. Don't worry about what's happening with, other, with that person or that person or that person. As we said earlier, God didn't call you to be someone else. He called you to be you. The death of your contentment is comparison. 
The death of your contentment is comparison. You will never get to where God wants you to be by constantly comparing yourself to other people. It's the reason they put blinders on horses. If I'm looking this way all the time, I'm not looking at where I should be and I'm not going to go the direction I need to go. And so many of us, we live our lives in such a way that we're always looking at, at this relationship and that car and this person and that person. And we're always looking this way and this way and this way. And what Jesus is saying, hey, I need your attention because I have a life that I want you to lead. The Spirit's saying, I want to direct your steps. I want to, I want to, I want to put, tell you how you need to navigate this situation and that situation. I want to give you grace for the life that you need to lead. But for so many of us, we're looking at the people around us and comparing our circumstances to the people around us. Your calling is original. The death of your contentment is comparison. Number three, or number four, your calling is personal. Your calling is a person. Your calling is personal. Your calling is a person. Just like Moses at the burning bush, just like Peter on the shore of Galilee, just like Paul on the road to Damascus, your calling is personal. God assigned it to you. Our identity always becomes, or always comes before our activity. Our identity always comes before our activity. If we look at Moses at the burning bush in Exodus, this is the first couple of chapters of the book of Exodus. Moses uh, is, is out on the backside of the wilderness and God appears to him in the form of a burn, burning bush. And he asks God some questions. He's like, well, who are, who are you? And that's where we get God saying, well, tell, tell the people I am that I am. This is the answer that God gives to Moses. And Moses kind of asks, well, who am I? Like, well, I don't have any gifts. I don't have any talents. I don't have this. And God tells him all this stuff. And so for many of us, like we're trying to figure out what our calling is and where God is taking us and what is happening. But we're skipping the steps of letting God shape our identity. Your calling is personal and your calling is to a person. If you're struggling with why you are in the situations that you're in, why you're in the stage of life that you're in, why are you here? Why are you in this place? Why are you going through the things that you're going through right now? If you're struggling with that right now, maybe what God is doing to you in, or what God is doing for you in this season is he's wanting to clarify your identity. He's wanting to clarify your identity in him. Maybe there's, there's a part of you that looks at someone else and says, well, they're my source. They're my supply. They're my source of happiness. They're my source of joy. They're my source. And you're, 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 you're looking at it and God's saying, no, 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 no. I want to clarify your identity. I want to clarify the person who is your source. I want to clarify these things in you. And God is doing that. And God is taking you through this season so that you can trust him more. Maybe there's a little too much of our flesh, too much pride, and not enough him, of him for us to accomplish the mission that he's put in front of us. And so we go through these seasons. We go through these seasons where it feels like, man, nothing's really happening. It's nothing's really, why am I not where I need to be? Why the, and it's because we need to look at our identity in Christ. You will have nothing to prove later down the road if you've already been approved by God. If God has already approved you, if you've gone through the work of letting him shape your identity, let him shape you as a person, let him shape you uh, as a, in, 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 let him take the things out that need to be taken out, let him put things in that need to be put in, let him be your source. If you've already gone through all these steps and you've been approved by God, you'll never have to prove anything to anyone else. Your calling is present, not future. Your calling is active, not passive. Your calling is original. Your calling is personal. And the last thing, your calling is big. The life that God has for you is big because God is big. God is big. And so whatever season that you find yourself in right now, don't minimize your steps. Don't minimize your steps. I have a kid that um, she wants to learn how to play golf. My 13-year-old wants to learn how to play golf. And I don't know if you ever guys swung a golf club before. It's hard. 
It's not easy. It's not like watching on TV where you're like, oh, yeah, they hit it like really far every time and it's straight every time and it's perfect every time. And it, no, like you're going to be terrible for a long period of time. But the only way to get to the place that where you're good is to grow in, <laughs> through the terribleness, right? You guys ever try to learn how to play piano or learn how to play guitar or learn how to draw or learn how to do anything that's worthwhile? And for so many of us, we're going through life and we're making mistakes and we, we see all these things and life is not what we need, that we want it to be. And we're going through all these things. And, and, and really what God is trying to do is he's trying to, he's trying to prove you. He's trying to help you. He's trying to shape you into what he wants you to be. He's trying to direct your steps. And we're like, oh, this is all terrible right now. What is happening? But God has you in a step right now where he's growing you. And he's shaping you. And he's taking things out that need to be taken out. He's putting things in that need to be put in. So many of us, we look at other people and we're like, man, like, I want a life like that. But we fail to realize all the work, all the struggle, all the pain, all the years that they were terrible, you know, to get to the point where they are now. Don't compare yourself to other people. Your calling is big because God is big. Don't minimize the step that you're in right now. In Ephesians 4, verse 1 through 3, Paul says this. I, therefore, as a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you have been called. And with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. A healthy church is only a group of healthy people unified in the pursuit of God. Live a life worthy of your calling.